Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us in this uh, unusual and unique um, method um, at the annual public meeting. And we are the Older People and Frailty Division. And first of all, to introduce ourselves, uh, my name is Stephen Roberts. I'm the Associate Director of Operations for the Division. Colin Tessiwe, Clinical Director for the Division. I'm Don Parker, Quality and Assurance Lead for the Older People Division. And we're going to talk to you briefly about moving on from COVID-19 um, and exploring the possibilities of the new normal, as it's being called. Um, and during that, basically, we'll give you a brief run through of the challenges we faced as a division um, and how we responded to those. But in talking about how we responded to them, telling you some of the lessons we've learned and the things that we're hoping that we can continue to do after COVID or as the situation progresses into the long term. So we're going to kick off first of all with Dawn, talking about the challenges and opportunities that this um, current situation. Thank you. Um, I don't know anybody that wouldn't say that COVID has been a challenge, both on a professional and a personal level and in delivering, particularly in older adults, our services. We know that, um, uh, shielding and isolation impacted on our patient group who were told largely to stay at home for numerous reasons. This meant as a service how do we how would we rise to the challenge of engaging with people who've been told to stay home. Um, we know that services access to certain services became very limited or shut down completely. We know that the care homes went into lockdown um, on advice with the compounded problems of unmet need within care homes. We know that staff were also having to shield and how do we deliver care differently with staff working from home and needing to do things differently. Um, we also needed to prevent admissions because of the risk of admission from COVID itself and how that would impact on our patient group and also how do we provide when things are closing and shutting down how do we ensure that our patient group and our carers have access to our services um, we know particularly from our engagement over the last two or three years that that out of hours that weekends that crisis time was a time that they wanted to make sure that the, that people had access to support and and how do we protect the most vulnerable within our caseloads and our patient group and how do you do this at a pace when you the pace is dictated by things outside your control and that was the challenge that we faced as an older adult service so what did we how did we respond to that and, and what did we do about that um, and what did we learn so I think what we're going to do now is just run through some of the key lessons we learned um, and some of the key bits of work that we did and what we feel we can take away from that. Well, one of the things we learned, first of all, is actually that we could change at pace, that we could make significant um, operational changes that when unrestrained and when necessitated by the need that was present. And one of the key things that we did was that we looked at consolidating our wards. We had to improve our staffing ratios to protect our most vulnerable staff and to do that we reduced the number of inpatient beds we had in order to enhance our staffing on our remaining beds. However, what that did mean was that we needed to reduce admissions into the ward, both because of the reduced beds and also because of the increased risk of infection that is um, unavoidably present in inpatient settings. So to support that, we quickly moved to seven day CMHT working with the support of our teams and also developed a dementia home treatment team to provide enhanced seven day a week um, support and input to patients with higher level needs for individuals experiencing dementia who otherwise would have been admitted. Um, this was an existing shortfall in service, so it did bring about an equity for older adults in terms of service provision um, and also met what we've known for a long time, and that is that healthcare needs don't stop on a Friday. In fact, they are seven days a week. And whilst we've known this for many, many years and it's been discussed, the current situation afforded us the opportunity and the necessity to move to that. And that means now we can evaluate the outcomes from that. 
We're proud to say that during this period, we've had no out of area admissions as a consequence of reducing beds and providing this service. And also looking forward, it means that we can look to better support the care homes and look at delivering services in a different way, which will obviously be part of the evaluation of our services. So they were two key things that we did operationally and in terms of configuration. Okay. Um, and as part of our divisional response, it made us stand still and, and actually focus on who and how we're delivering our services and making sure that we delivered support to our most vulnerable and it was defining vulnerability in the sense of the pandemic, but also in terms of reduced access to other services and, G, uh, and how that impacted on people. It made us look at our pathways and the realisation actually it's, it should be a patient pathway and not um, a service led path pathway. And I think due to the close collaboration that we had within the division um, that enabled us to to start doing that. It's also made a real sharp focus on our response to our carers. We closed visiting on our inpatient wards, um, access in terms that Collins will talk about in terms of um, information that supports assessment pathways. We had to relook really at that and making sure that we had clear plans, documented plans, have to consultation with carers that, that we ask carers, how do you want us to consult with you? How do you want us to engage with you? How do you want us to support with you? And that we delivered that and that we checked that we were delivering that. It made us um, also, we did several checks during this time to make sure that we're delivering services in a way that patients and carers still understood how they could access and be supported and use technology I think was the key things and doing things differently challenging our own assumptions as well in in within that. Okay so um, um, COVID-19 obviously made us think a lot about how we would deliver services and technology was something that we knew was key and we had to challenge the old way of thinking about how things were wrong. There were about five main areas where we tend to work. One is the clinics, uh, the ward um, and the memory assessment services. And also we uh, relied a lot on CT scans and blood tests. So these five areas were areas where we had to think about what to do differently. So with our clinics, we had to quickly look at um, our patients because most of them would require traveling to these places, uh, to our sites. And with COVID-19, this was not possible anymore. Uh, we had to uh, change to telephone assessment and video uh, um, assessment. And to our surprise, uh, our patients embraced these changes. Uh, the carers were happy to be called at home and the assessments continued as normal using technology. Uh, this had benefits for our services as well. Uh, travel time was less and throughput through our services and waiting times were not affected as a result of these changes. With the wards, again, ward rounds have traditionally been things that we've always thought you had to do face to face. But again, we had um, as Steve mentioned, we had to consolidate our patients onto one site. Um, there was a high degree of pathology in older people during the COVID crisis, high levels of anxiety, high levels of psychotic illnesses, depression uh, was very high. And we had uh, our wards full of very unwell people. And that meant that patients had to be reviewed. But again, technology uh, made this work. So ward rounds were done through video, um, we were able to rag rate our patients so that those who were red or those who were classified as high risk were those that we were able to see face to face. And those who were classified as less risky patients uh, were able to be assessed or reviewed through video or telephone. But we also gave patients the choice uh, that if they wanted to see a consultant or a doctor, that option was still there. Uh, so it, it, it was about offering a personalized approach to our patients and sort of like instead of having one size fits all, we, we were able to tailor our services or our offer to the needs of the patient. The patient was central. Memory clinics, again, is another part of our service where we traditionally do them by either driving to the patient's home or asking them to come to our services. Again, we had to look at our pathways. 
we changed that very early on and modified them to virtual memory clinics. So patients were assessed over the phone and, and questionnaires were completed by our staff. And we were able to, again, um, if needed, bring patients in for only specific parts of the pathway. And we relied less on tests and technology allowed us to assess patients and access all the investigations that we would often ask patients to repeat. We had access to the care portal that allowed us to look at blood tests, CT scans, and that meant we didn't have to order these tests again. The benefits again was that weights were cut down and patients were seen on time. Neuroimaging is one part of our pathway that we tend to do quite a bit. CT scans and x-rays and things that we tend to do on older people. Um, and I don't know if, if it's uh, what we found out was that the acute hospital uh, were no longer offering uh, routine CT scans. That meant that for patients who were going to have investigations, a, a lot of these things had stopped. So we had to think uh, and, and adapt our processes. And we relied a lot on clinical assessments. We standardized our pathways. We offered training to our staff, which meant they became more confident in, in um, taking histories and uh, were able to continue offering diagnostic uh, um, assessments for our patients without the need for CT scans. Obviously, uh, where patients needed to have scans and if it was an, an um, urgent CT scans, the offer was still there. And finally, investigation. So we very often ask GPs to do blood tests. And in these instances, many patients were not being, uh, were, were not able to go out. Uh, they, they were scared and they were all at home. Uh, through the home treatment teams, we were able to offer assessments at home. Uh, we did blood tests. Uh, ECGs and offered investigations for our patients at home. And this allowed um, assessments to, to continue without any impact on quality. Um, so if I have to conclude here, what, is, what this has taught me or taught us here is that uh, technology and old ways of working have been challenged by COVID-19. Uh, we've been able to deliver services without any impact on quality or waiting times uh, throughout the crisis. We were surprised to hear that in some parts of the country, memory assessment services ceased to operate, but we continued at pace. And, and this clearly is something that we intend to continue to do moving forward. Okay, okay thank you, Collins. And I suppose one of the, the challenges there is how we sustain change within what's now called the new normal. And I, I think it's fair to say that a lot of these changes are in their infancy, but from the last few months in looking at how we could continue to support patients during these incredibly difficult times have offered us insights into opportunities that brought about positive patient choice and provided options that we can develop further and to enhance our service capacity and response and also therefore our patient experience. Um, however, I think it's fair to say that we now need to evaluate those and start to look at any risks that have been introduced and respond to those as well. But it has allowed us to challenge, as Colin said, old paradigms and traditions, old assumptions that we ourselves held about how things had to be done. And I think that's been the biggest change. And that has generated some interest in the way that we're thinking regionally um, for us to start sharing those ideas because we are thinking differently about how we do things. So where does that take us? Well, I think very quickly to summarise what it, it's shown us is that, that necessity truly is the mother of invention, that, that when things need to happen, they can, and that the system and the services can respond and adapt efficiently, effectively when required, and certainly when they're less restrained. However, as I said, that comes with the proviso that we have to have that hindsight and look at the risks it introduced, but that we can change at pace, I think is incredibly important because it means that we can evaluate whether things are effective or not far more quickly. But as especially I think Collins and, and Dawn have both highlighted what it's really brought to the forefront, if it needed to ever be brought to the forefront, e even more than it was, was that this is about patient experience, about how they interface with our services, about how we do things, and that they have to be at the centre of everything we do, pandemic or no pandemic. So that's it for us. It was a very quick talk through, um, but happy to take any questions anybody has.